Thanks, Adam, and thanks everyone for inviting me to talk a little bit about our experience with Tempest. I'll start with a little bit of background on what we believe to be an important new target in cancer drug development, uh, DKK1, and how at LEAP we're addressing this through our drug DKN01. And I'll show some examples of how we have utilized Tempest real world evidence data to support these efforts, especially in gastric cancer. So as I said, we think DKK1 is an important new target in cancer development. It's overexpressed in many cancers, often leading to a worse prognosis for patients. It's secreted mainly by tumor cells and signals to tumor as well as immune endothelial cells. And all of this helps to promote the cancer development through proliferation, metastasis, and angiogenesis. And it does this through a few mechanisms shown here. So one, it combines with the CCAP4 receptor on tumor cells and activate the PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway. In addition, it has a significant impact on tumor cells in the microenvironment, signaling directly to MDSCs to enhance their activity, while also decreasing the activity of NK cells. And all this combines to create a more immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And we also have evidence to suggest that TKK1 can promote angiogenesis through increased VEGFR2 expression in the vessels. Next slide. So then by neutralizing DKK1 with our drug DKN01, you may be able to reverse this pro-tumorigenic effect of DKK1 through down-regulating the AKT PI3 kinase pathway on tumor cells, remodeling that tumor microenvironment to create a more favorable immune response to attack the cancer, um, and then by decreasing angiogenesis. So it's really this multi-pronged attack on the cancer cells as well as the microenvironment and the blood vessels that run through it, all which we believe contribute to the activity of DKN01. Next slide. So being a small company right now without our own lab, we really need to identify other ways to further our understanding of DKK1 and cancer development and how our drug may be effective, including helping us to prioritize different indications as well as combinations and correlations with other biomarkers. Uh, these are a few common questions that we often get, which have sort of triggered us to look into real world evidence to address them. So where is DKK1 highly expressed? And I'm not only talking about which cancers, but even within those cancers, you know, which subtypes or which stages of the disease? Is it a unique biomarker or are we inadvertently just selecting patients who have high PDL1, for example? Are there certain cancers where DKK1 is a marker of poor outcomes? that are independent of treatment and maybe are also a resistance mechanism to certain standard of care treatments. Uh, how does the marker change over time with different treatments? And what do we know about the heterogeneity? You know, and as we think about, again, one of the main mechanisms of DKK1 is, is modulating the immune system. Uh, what do we know about baseline levels as correlated to some of these different immune cell types? So today I'm gonna to focus on mainly on the two questions in bold as we go through. Next slide. So as I mentioned, DKK1 is often associated with worse clinical outcomes, including rapid progression of disease and poor survival. But in addition to just being an overall poor prognostic marker, we also believe it's a key resistance mechanism to certain standard of care therapies. So to look at this closer, we've been working with Tempest to look at several common treatment regimens in gastric and GEJ cancers, such as platinum and fluoropyrimidine-based therapies. These are typically used in the frontline setting of gastric cancer. And what we found is that high DKK1, uh, as shown in, in red here, is correlated with worse outcomes on such therapies. So regardless of whether you use a cutoff corresponding to the upper tertile of DKK1 or even a higher cutoff, you can see this trend where high DKK1 patients discontinue treatment faster compared to those with low DKK1 patients. If you go to the next slide, this is also true when we look at paclitaxel-based regimens that are commonly used in the second line setting in gastric cancer. So again, patients with high DKK1 RNA expression trend towards a shorter survival and faster treatment discontinuation as compared to those that are in the middle or lower tertiles. Uh, so again, we believe this population of patients with high DKK1 who don't respond well to standard of care therapies may represent a real unmet medical need and this Tempest data has really helped us to demonstrate it. Next slide. So with all this in mind, we ran a study in gastric and GEJ cancers to look at the activity of DKN01, uh, along with Beijing's PD-1 inhibitor, tizolizumab. This included a frontline cohort known as Part A, 
where we combine DKN01 plus TIS and chemotherapies, uh, including capecitabine and oxaliplatin, so the, the platinum fluoroperimidine regimen that I just mentioned. Uh, and in this part, we retrospectively looked at DKK1 expression using RNA and C2 hybridization. This part is currently fully enrolled and, and the data was recently reported at ESMO. Uh, we've also uh, begun a second line cohort of DKN01 plus TIS, specifically in DKK1 high patients, which is currently ongoing. But today I'll focus on that part A frontline data uh, that we recently presented at ESMO. Next slide. So here I'm showing all the patients on the study who we were able to evaluate, where we were able to evaluate their response, so meaning they received a scan, uh, and who received at least two doses of DKN01 as part of a, a first cycle of therapy. So they had to at least have made it through one cycle and gotten a scan. And as you can see, every single patient in this population had a reduction of their tumor. Uh, further, when we looked at the patients by their DKK1 status, it was clear that the, those patients with high DKK1, as shown in green here, are more towards the right side of this waterfall with improved responses, so partial responses and more substantial tumor reductions. Next slide. And in fact, all nine of the DKK1 high patients who we had had a partial response, which is defined by at least 30% tumor reduction. There was one patient who was non evaluable because they didn't see the scan. Uh, so in that context, it's 90% it's of the patients who had a PR. Uh, but as you can see, seven of the nine patients with a PR and who are DKK1 high are still on study and going strong. And this is compared to 56% of the, the patients with low DKK1 who had a partial response. So there's clearly efficacy in both the high and low biomarker patients, but it's enhanced with those in high DKK1. Next slide. And this is the spider plot where you can see the duration of responses at the time of, of our data cut. And as I said, uh, most of the patients in green are still on study with high DKK1. But again, you can see that the green or high DKK1 patients are really at the bottom here with the greatest tumor reductions. Next slide. So as I mentioned, one of the questions that we always get asked being in combination with a PD-1 inhibitor is whether the response that we're seeing is really driven by the PD-1 and DKN01 is just along for the ride. So we know that PD-1 inhibitors are most effective in patients with high PDL1. To the point where we have several physicians say they'll only give the PD-1 plus chemo to patients with high CPS PDL1 scores above five. And I think this is really important that when you look at our data, we see responses regardless of PDL1 status. And in fact, the patients that you would expect to do worse on a PD-1 PD inhibitor, those high DKK1, low PDL1 patients actually have 100% response rate uh, with the addition of DKN01. So the response here is clearly not driven by PDL1. Next slide. So when you look at this another way on the dot plot here, we're able to see a few key points. Uh, one, there's no correlation between DKK1 and PDL1 expression. So you have several patients that have high of one biomarker, low in the other, and vice versa. Uh, so we're not just inadvertently selecting patients who have high CPS PDL1 scores. And two, while we do see that DKK1 is correlated with enriched response, the same is not true for PDL1. We see responses independent of PDL1 expression, including several at CPS scores of zero. Uh, so again, not just due to PD1. Um, and you can clearly see here how the majority of patients on this study actually have low PDL1 scores. We only have two patients that have a CPS above 10 and nobody above 20. So it's really a low PDL1 population, which again is least likely to respond to a PD1 inhibitor, yet we have a great response with the addition of DKN01. Next slide. So despite all the evidence that our response is due to DKN01 or the synergy between the two drugs, uh, we still get questions asking whether this trends hold true in other larger data sets. And this is where we actually initially came to Tempest. First wanting to look at the correlation between DKK1 expression and PDL1 expression in a real world data set. And as you can see here, whether you're looking at PDL1 based on mRNA, or IHC, there's simply no correlation between the PDL1 and DKK1. So again, we're not just inadvertently picking out high PDL1 patients with DKK1. And this is truly an independent and unique biomarker. Next slide. And there's additional evidence that DKK1 is really a unique marker for PDL1. We wanted to look at how DKK1 may affect response to PD1 therapies alone. So we have not run a study in PD1 alone. But this is where we use Tempest's data. 
Uh, so again, we looked at the correlation between DKK1 and time to treatment discontinuation of a PD-1 therapy in gastric patients. And as expected, you see no correlation uh, between DKK1 status and how they do on a PD-1 therapy. The curves are for high and low DKK1 are right on top of each other here, uh, indicating that DKK1 status has no effect on PD-1 outcomes alone. And just as a control, we also looked at PDL1 status as a function of response to PD-1 uh, therapies. And you can see, as you would expect, that patients with high PDL1 uh, PD scores do better on a PD-1 therapy. Uh, so I think this data was really able to supplement and further enhance the data that we've generated in the clinic. Again, suggesting that you know, while PDL1 is a marker of response to PD1, it's not a marker of response to a combination with our drug. And DKK1 can serve as a predictive marker of response as a unique biomarker. Next slide. So just to sum up, you know, I think real world evidence with Tempest has really supported what we're doing in our current studies you know, by, by demonstrating that the trends in our gastric trial really do extend over a large patient population. We, have, we had a relatively small patient population in our trial, but I think what you've seen here when looking at the biomarker is that these may extend. Uh, we've also worked with Tempest to show that our marker does correlate with worse outcomes on standard of care therapies. And because we ran a single arm study, this gives us some insight into how we may have done on a control arm and how that arm may, may uh, work in future studies. And as I've been saying, this is really a unique biomarker that doesn't overlap with other markers like PDL1. I also want to mention that while I focused on gastric cancer here, we have uh, worked with Tempus on other projects and other indications, uh, including endometrial cancer, where we reported clinical data. And I think Tempus data there has also helped us to extend that to a larger patient population, uh, looking at other indications where DKK1 might be high or correlate with poor outcomes on patients or, or, or uh, enhanced wind signaling. So it's really been a great partnership between LEAP and Tempest.